As the prison ship sailed out against the sky For she lived in hope and pray For her love and bought me pain It's so lonely round the fields of that Let's hear it now I've never loved before Since first I saw you on the village green Come to me in my dreams of love alone I love you as I love you when you are sweet When you are sweet Sixteen
Seconds from my heart, I put it from the door. Helpless, I surrender, shackled by your love, holding me like this. Poison on your lips, only when it's over, the silence hits so hard. Cause it was almost love, it was almost love. It was almost love, it was almost love When I heard that sound ourselves in vain how tragic is this game turn around i'm holding on to someone but the love's gone carrying the load with wings that feel like stone knowing that we need be fair so far now it's hard to tell yeah we came so close it was almost like it was almost long, it was almost long When I heard that sound I come from down the 
They bring you up to do Like your daddy John Me and Mary, we met in high school And she was just seventeen We drive out of this valley Down to where fields were green We go down Test, test, check, test, check, test.
just like the river I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. It's been too. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes it will. I go to the movie and I go downtown. Somebody keep telling me. Help me please But he winds up Knocking me Back down on my knees Oh There have been times That I thought I couldn't laugh But I know a change gon' come. Oh, yes, it will.
I hurt myself today to see if I still feel I focus on the pain the only thing that's real the needle tears a hole the old familiar sting try to kill it all away but I remember everything what have I become my sweetest friend everyone I know goes away in the end and you could have it all my empire of dirt I will let you down I will make you hurt I wear this crown of thorns upon my liar's chair full of broken thoughts I cannot repair beneath the stains of time the feelings disappear you are someone else I am still right here what have I become my sweetest friend every Searching every corner of my mind Looking for the answers I can't find I have my reasons and life has its lessons I try to be grateful and count all my blessings But heavy is the head that wears the crown Amen in Jesus' name, yes, I declare it. Any little seed I receive, I have to share it. Brothers, when they break me down, I can't bear it. But heavy is the head with the crown, I still wear it. You can't hold me down, I still cope. Rain falling down at the bricks, I'm still soaked. Try to put a hole in our ship, we'll build boats. Two birds with one stone, I pull both. Pray I never lose and pray I never hit the shelf. Promise if I do that, you'll be checking on my health. If it's for my people, I'll do anything to help. If I do it out of love, it's not to benefit myself. Ooh, gotta stay around, but make a comeback too. I know my only mother wants a son back too. Saying I'm the voice of the young black youth And then I say, yeah, cool And then I bum my zoo And now I'm Searching every corner of my mind Searching every corner Look for the answers Looking for the answers I can't find I can find them I 
have my reasons and Life has its lessons and Try to be grateful and Count all my blessings But heavy is the head that wears the crown Amen in Jesus' name, oh yes I claim it Any little bread that I make, I have to break it Brothers wanna break me down, I can't take it I done a scholarship for the kids, they said it's racist That's not anti-white, it's pro-black Hang me out to dry, I won't crack All these fancy ties and gold plaques Never had no silver spoons in our mouths, we sold Like, don't comment on my porch, you ain't qualified Stab us in the back and then apologise If you knew my story, you'd be horrified The irony of trapping on the borough's back Gotta stay alive and save my brother as well Look at all these legends on the cover of hell Long time coming, but we come to prevail I guess a little bit of heaven has to come with the hell, you know? Searching every corner of my mind Looking for the answers I can't find. I have my reasons. Life has its lessons. Try to be grateful and count all my blessings. But heavy is the head that wears the Just yesterday morning, they let me know you were gone. Suzanne, the plans they made put an end to you. I walked out this morning and I wrote down this song. I just can't remember who to send it to. I've seen fire and I've seen rain. Seen sunny days that I thought would never end. I seen lonely times when I could not find a friend. But I always thought that I'd see you again. Won't you look down upon me, Jesus? You gotta help me make a stand. Just got to see me through another day My body's aching and my time is at hand I won't make it any other way Oh, I've seen fire and I've seen rain I've seen sunny days that I thought would never end When I could not find a friend But I always thought that I'd see you again Been walking my mind to an easy time My back turned towards the sun Lord knows when the cold wind blows It'll turn your head around hours the time on the telephone line to talk about things to come sweet dreams and flying machines in pieces on the ground oh I've seen fire and I've seen rain I've seen sunny days that I thought would never end I've seen lonely times when I could not find But I always thought that I'd see you, baby, one more time again. Thought I'd see you one more time again. There's just a few things coming my way this time around now. 
Exact around her face, a look of half surprise, like a fox caught in the headlights. There was animal in her eye. She said to me, Can't you see? I'm not the factory kind, and if you don't take me over here, I lose my mind. Oh, she was a rarity, fine as a beezer. So fine a breath of wind might blow her away She was a lost child She was running wild She said so long as there's no price on no one's day We bust around the market towns Fruit picking down in tents we could tinker pots and pans and knives wherever we went. We were camping down the gower, but the work was mighty good. She wouldn't wait for the harvest, and I thought we should. I said to her, we'll settle down, and get a few acres dug, with a fire burning in the heart and babies on the rug. She said, oh man, you foolish man, that surely sounds like right hell. You might be lord of half the world, you'll not own me as well. Oh, she was a little fine as a bee's wing. So fine a breath of wind might blow her away. She was a lost child. She was running wild. She said, so long as there's no price in love and stay. We were drinking all in those days, her tempers reached a pitch. Like a fool, I let her run away when she took the ramble hitch. And the last I heard, she's living rough. Back in the derby beat With a bottle of white horse in her pocket A wolf found at her feet They say that she got married once To a man called Romany Brown Even a gypsy caravan Was too much like settling down They say the roses faded Rough weather and hard bones Maybe that's the price you pay for the chance you refuse. Oh, she was little, fine as a bee's And I miss her more than ever words can say. If I could just taste all of her wildness now. If I could hold her in my arms today.
Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. From glen to glen and down the mountainside. The summer's gone and all the roses fall. It's you, it's you. I must go and I must buy. But come ye back when summer's in the meadow, or when the valley's hushed and white with snow. I'll be here in sunshine. Or in shadow, oh, Danny boy, oh, Danny boy, I love you so. But if you come and all the flowers are dying, and I am dead, as dead I will be. 
you come and find the place where I am lying and you and see and Avi therefore me and I will know though soft ye tread above me and then my grave will richer sweeter be and you'll bend down and tell me that you love me and I will rest in peace until you come
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. We shall place the Christian symbols, the symbol of Margaret's faith journey. In life, Margaret cherished the gospel of Christ. May Christ now greet her with these words of eternal life. Come, blessed of my Father. In baptism, Margaret received the sign of the cross. May she now share in Christ's victory over sin and death. Very good morning and welcome brothers and sisters and my dear children uh, into St. Boniface Catholic Church. Uh, welcome in a special way all our distinguished guests, Margaret's uh, colleagues, friends. In a special way, I welcome Margaret's family, Sister Siobhan and other members of our family. And also I welcome all those who are unable to join us today people back in Ireland and other parts of the world. We are united with them in spirit. Lastly, I welcome Margaret among us. On this last time, we are with her. We all are sad and sorrowful today because we are gathered to say a farewell to Margaret, a person who gave so much to the family, to the nation, to a party. A totally dedicated person, loving, caring, and giving. A champion of social justice, option for poor. We all have a, a similar feeling today, asking ourselves and God, why she is taken away at a younger age. We don't have answer to it, but God knows. We are gathered here not to celebrate just our sadness and sorrow. We are gathered to celebrate a great life. Her sacrifices, her kindness, her generosity, and her great service to our nation. We are people of faith. That is why we are gathered in this church, that everything is not over. We shall see her again and enjoy that togetherness and kindness and generosity. So with that faith and hope, let us offer Margaret in the hands of our Savior and ask our Lord to forgive her, bless her, and receive her in his eternal home. At the beginning of this sacrifice of the Mass, we pause for a moment and acknowledge our weakness, bring to Lord all the sins we have committed. And today, on behalf of Margaret, we ask for God's mercy, all the sins she committed of her, of her human weaknesses. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done 
and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters. The Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. O God, whose nature is always to forgive and to show mercy, we humbly implore you for your servant, Margaret Magdona, whom you have called from this world to yourself. And since she hoped and believed in you, grant that she may be led to our true homeland to delight in its everlasting joys. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated and listen to the word of God. May I invite Honorable John Reed, please come forward and lead us to the first reading. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil I've seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds. Yet they cannot find out what God has done 
from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all, all should eat and drink to take pleasure in all their toil. Know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already is. And God seeks out what has gone by. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May I invite Julie McDonough to lead us through the responsorial song. The response to the psalm is, the Lord is my light. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my life's refuge. Of whom should I be afraid? The Lord is my light. When evildoers come at me to devour my flesh, these my enemies and foes themselves stumble and fall. The Lord is my light. Though an army encamp against me, my heart does not fear. Though war be waged against me, even then do I trust. The Lord is my light. One thing I ask of the Lord, this I ask, to dwell in the Lord's house all the days of my life, to gaze on the Lord's beauty, to visit his temple. I now invite Roy Kennedy to lead us through the second reading. A reading from the book of James. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled. Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed 
by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory Jesus went off to the other side of the Sea of Galilee or of Tiberias and a large crowd followed him, impressed by the signs he gave by curing the sick. Jesus climbed the hillside and sat down there with his disciples. It was shortly before the Jewish feast of Passover. Looking up, Jesus saw the crowds approaching and said to Philip, where can we buy some bread for these people to eat? He only said this to test Philip. He himself knew exactly what he was going to do. Philip answered, 200 denarii would only buy enough to give them a small piece each. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said, there is a small boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what is that between so many. Jesus said to them, make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass there, and as many as 5,000 sat down. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and gave them out to all who were sitting ready. He then did the same with the fish, giving out as much as was wanted. When they had eaten enough, he said to the disciples, pick up the pieces left over so that nothing gets wasted. So they picked them up and filled 12 hampers with scraps left over from the meal of five barley loaves. The people seeing this sign that he had given said, this really is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, who could see they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, escaped back to the hills by himself. The Gospel of the Lord. In the order of service for today's Mass, there are two photographs of Margaret with the caption, Awesome, Not Perfect, with the E, C, and T falling away from the first four letters of perfect. 
What is this telling us? No doubt, surely, that none of us is perfect. We have our strengths and our weaknesses. We can be awesome, as Margaret was and is awesome, but there is still some way to go for all of us. And so we gather this morning in this church of St. Boniface in Tooting, close to the home of Siobhan and Margaret and their parents, Cumin and Breda, to give thanks to God for Margaret's life, to commend her soul to a loving and tender God, and to, pray, and to pray that Margaret is now sharing in the fullness of life in heaven, as she surely is. This God of tenderness and love came to us as one like us in all things but sin, in the person of Jesus Christ. And the Son of God called those who met him, those who listened to the good news of the kingdom, those who saw the miracles of healing and transformation taking place in his public ministry, those who experienced God in Christ touching the lives of those in the margins, the little ones, the forgotten ones, Jesus Christ called all these people to follow him. And he said to them, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But the E, the C, and the T are not falling away in this case. Of course, Jesus is not talking here of a perfection without flaws. The perfection of which Jesus speaks is of a different kind. It is more to do with striving to be as God is, to allow God's glory to shine in our lives and in the lives of others, to serve as Christ serves, to see in the faces of those in need, the face of Christ himself. To feed those who are hungry, hungry for food, for justice, for goodness, for truth. As the letter of St. James reminds us, faith and good works are inextricably linked. How can you claim to be a person of faith if you do not commit yourself to a life of service? I met Margaret some 20 years ago when we both served as governors of a school facing considerable challenges. Here was someone who had been, who was, at the very center of national political life, committing herself to the well-being and the future of those who were literally voiceless. Margaret made a deep impression, and her witness encouraged many to speak up for those who had no voice. How tempting it is to turn away from the right path, to take the route of least resistance. And yet how refreshing and encouraging it is to meet and work with someone who refuses to do this. There is a time for everything, as the book of Ecclesiastes tells us. And that time is truly inhabited by those to seek to do as God would do. Miracles do happen in our lives when we allow them to happen. The faith into which Margaret was baptized, 
the faith we share in and celebrate in this Mass is a faith which has new life and resurrection at its core. Yes, new life here on earth, resurrection for those who are weighed down in any way, and then the fullness of life in heaven at the end of our earthly journey. In the gospel today, we've heard that Jesus takes, blesses, breaks, and gives bread to the hungry. How can five barley loaves and two fish feed 5,000 and still have 12 hampers of scraps left over? In a moment, we will receive the body of Christ in Holy Communion to be the body of Christ in our world. The Mass, the Eucharist, is both the memorial, the representation of the one saving sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for all people. But it is also the promise of future glory, the glory of eternal life as the culmination of our service of God's people here on earth. In chapter 25 of St. Matthew's Gospel, we hear Jesus say, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. But Jesus is questioned. When did we see you hungry and give you food? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? A stranger and made you welcome, naked and clothed you, sick and cared for you, in prison and visited you. When? And Jesus replies, in so far as you did it to one of these little ones, to the least in society, you did it to me. Today, to Margaret, the Lord says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And to Siobhan, our deepest sympathy and the assurance of our prayers, but also the wonder of knowing the beauty and the goodness of a sister who lived her life and her faith to the full in serving others. And so eternal rest grant unto Margaret, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon her. May she rest in peace now with her beloved parents, Breda and Cumin. And may we live our faith in serving all in need and come one day to the fullness of life in heaven. And yes, be reunited with Margaret and all those who have gone before us in faith. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, now let us stand up and pray together for Margaret and also for her family. All those who are going to lead us through the prayers of intercession, please come forward. For Margaret, who in baptism was given the pledge of eternal life, that she may now be admitted to the company of saints and join her parents, Breda and Cumin, in her legion of friends who have passed before, including David Cairns and Sheila Draper. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, we pray for the 3,200 people who will be diagnosed with a glioblastoma brain tumour in the UK this year. May they benefit from improved treatment, increased clinical trials, and access to properly qualified staff. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. On the 75th anniversary of the NHS, we give thanks to all the doctors, nurses and staff at both St George's and UCL hospitals who cared for Margaret. May they have the strength and determination to continue their work. Lord mercy. Hear our We pray for all politicians and political activists everywhere who strive for a better country and a better world. May they remain true to their cause and to your people. May they be guided by your teachings of service and humility. Lord, in your mercy. Hear yeah. yeah. Grant us the strength, O Lord, of stoicism and love shown by Margaret throughout her life and during her illness. Grant us her skills to bring together people from all backgrounds in one community. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. In silence we bring to Lord all our other prayers we have. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the wonderful gift for Margaret to us. Listen to the prayers we have brought to you on behalf of her and her family. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated and prepare for offertory. All those who are bringing uh, offertory, please uh, gather at the back of the church.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. For through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth, and the work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. For the mystery of this water and wine, we share in his divinity who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the wine and the work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God. Receive us, O Lord, and all our prayers, and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with a humble and contrite heart. Pray, my sisters and brothers and my dear children, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May, may the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands for the praise and the glory of his name. Be near, O Lord, we pray to your servant Margaret, on whose funeral day we offer you the sacrifice of conciliation so that should any stain or sin have clung to her or any human fault have affected her, it may, by a loving gift, be forgiven and wiped away through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right in us. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him, the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for a faithful Lord, life he changed not ended and when this earthly dwelling turns to dust an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven and so with angels and archangels with the thrones and dominions and with all the hosts and powers of heaven we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim
You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all your creator rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, Jesus Christ, Amen. our Lord, by the power and the working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all <coughs> things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become for us the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. From the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. <clears throat> the mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you, are, you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body and one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with Saint Boniface, Saint Margaret, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis our Pope, John Wilson our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember your servant Margaret, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that she, who was united with your son in a death like his, may also be one with him in his resurrection. 
when from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform our lowly body after the pattern of his own glorious body. To our departed brothers and sisters too, and to all who are pleasing to you as they are passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, when you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. For seeing you are God as you are, we should be like you for all the ages, and praise you without end, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Let us raise our mind and heart and bring Margaret in our prayers and also all those people who dedicated their life to poor and the needy, we remember in our prayers. So we raise our mind and heart and pray together in the words our Saviour taught us. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come. thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for the, the kingdom, kingdom the power, and the glory of you. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Peace and joy of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Peace, peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who call to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I, am I am not worthy, worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the, the word, word, and my soul shall be here.
This is the time for communion if you are a Catholic and uh, you are most welcome to receive the communion. And if you are not a Catholic or even a Catholic, if you are unable to receive the communion, you can be in a spiritual communion. You can receive a blessing from the priest. If you are coming for a blessing, may I request you cross your hands like this so that the priest knows that you are coming for a blessing and not for communion. Communion will be distributed uh, in, in, in the front of the aisle and also in the middle and also all those who are in the parish hall, the communion will be uh, brought to you. So please uh, remain uh, in the parish hall. Uh, if you can't receive the communion, please be seated and uh, join the communion hymn. Thank you very much.
Jesse. There is another
Please stand. Lord God, whose Son left us in the sacrament of his body, food for the journey, mercifully grant that, strengthened by it, our sister Margaret may come to the eternal table of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. May I now invite uh, the family members and the friends who are giving tribute. May I invite first Sarah James. Please come forward. It's in big writing, so not worry too much. Um, when Siobhan first asked me to do this, apart from a moment of absolute blind panic, I started to think how on earth you could characterise Margaret in mere words. Um, it's like being in the presence of a Michelangelo painting or a perfect symphony. You are awed in its presence, in their presence, but actually, uh, trying to find the right words is inadequate. You know you're seeing something of great beauty and power. But nevertheless, it is our responsibility. We are compelled to try and do so and pay homage and bear witness to a dynamic woman and a full and extraordinary life. I first met Margaret in university some 40 years ago. I think it might even be 45 by now, at uh, the inauguration of the women's group. If truth be told, we tried to set up a women's group for two years before Margaret got there, and, well, you've read the works, really. Um, really, they all ended in tears as people fell out with each other over the trivial thing, you know, five women in a room, 27 deeply held convictions that you had to express as loudly as you possibly could. It's an extraordinary tribute to Margaret that actually, when she pitched up, that all changed. Her and a group of young women who were committed and became a group that offered each other mutual support and actually achieved some really good work. It's also a further tribute to Margaret that that group of women are still friends, despite Margaret cutting one of their hair and her crying, and Karen having to pretend she'd never met Margaret before and serve on some committee somewhere. So, anonymous sort of way, really. So, um, I invited the group of women for dinner. It was amazing what glamour you could produce on a two-ring baby belling cooker. Um, and the group of friends. I'd never actually spoken to her, and I realised at one point I'd invited all the others but hadn't found Margaret. In those days, we didn't have WhatsApp, we didn't have texts, we were reliant on word of mouth. And I walked into the library one day, getting a bit worried that I hadn't actually asked her to come for dinner, uh, and there she was sitting in the library, surrounded by books, but staring into space, with a very irritated look on her face, actually. So I hesitated for a minute to walk up and invite her, um, she was a bit formidable, even in those years, and ever so slightly scary, really. So, but I did walk up and said, would you like to come to dinner tomorrow night? And she smiled. That beautific smile that Margaret has, where she makes you feel that you're really important, that your glamorous baby belling cooker production will actually really work. Really. So there will be lots of tributes to Margaret's great totemic political life that she lived, but I want to think about Margaret, my friend, really. Um, and I characterise the time we spent together as never a dull moment, really. So our first little trip together was in the indomitable yellow mini. We travelled to see my parents in Wales. We hadn't planned it, not like Margaret, but she just wanted to get it done, really. Um, and so off we sat in the little yellow mini, uh, and eight hours later, we finally made it to Wales. My dad had said, when you get to Oswestry, you just follow the HR route. The HR route stood for holiday route, so we were stuck behind every caravan in the whole of Western Europe. We had one tape, I'll let you guess what that tape was, answers on a postcard please, um, and we listened to it all the way up and down, uh, so by the time we got there it was almost time to turn around and come back again really, so, um, and Margaret's spirit never faltered, she was humorous, amusing, all the way there and all the way back and incredibly gracious to my parents when we got there. Long trip to Anglesey and before actually motorways were invented. 
My next memory of her was going to Crown Road one day. She was working there for the summer. Uh, and I thought, if you get invited over on a Saturday, it's usually quite good because you get to stay for Margaret and Siobhan's uh, Sunday dinner that their mum used to cook. The best roast potatoes I have ever tasted. Everything else has paled into insignificance since then, really. Um, so I pitched up, and she was sitting there with lots of to-do lists, and she was moving through them. Uh, and she had the uh, telephone directory opened in front of her. And I thought, I wonder what that's for. But I didn't ask. And anyhow, every time anybody else would have gone for a break or a cigarette in those days, um, she went back to working her way through the uh, telephone directory. Again, I didn't ask. Uh, on the way back to Boundary Road, uh, we stopped at a house, and Margaret said, see that house? Yes, I said. Um, I'm supposed to be feeding the cats there, but I've locked the keys in the house. Oh, I thought, quite a dilemma, I thought, really. So, come with me, she said. So, off I trotted behind her. Uh, and we knocked on the next-door neighbour's door. The next-door neighbour answered the door. And the next-door neighbour said, uh, yes. And Margaret said, I'm supposed to be feeding the cats next door, but I've locked the keys in the house. So, can my friend get over your fence, please? <laughs> um, I don't think he even answered that. I don't think he said yes or no. Margaret just marched in. And I turned round to look for the friend. And then it dawned on me, I was the friend, and I was going to get over that fence. And I came and said, come on, get, yes, you can. Over the fence, I went, the rocks will break your fall, she said, as I fell down the other side. And when I got to the side, she said, just go and check the back door to see if it's open. No, it's not. Oh, never mind, here's the kitty cat. Just flick it through the cat flap. So I spent the whole weekend flicking it through the... And the cat spent the whole time running around in circles trying to pick that up. So that was... It, Another example of never, and I'm reminded of uh, Laurel and Hardy when I think about those as well. So um, I'm also reminded of two other uh, um, opportunities she had for a career. One purely accidental, um, a McDonough family outing to Norfolk, Thornham, um, and I went over to join them for the day, uh, Margaret and Siobhan and her mum and dad and the hound, Elvis. And off we went, and where would you go for a day out? Walsingham, to the Catholic shrine. So we went there. And on the way back, and Margaret was driving this huge bus in her flip-flops, I've got to say. Um, and we stopped in Walsingham to make sure we got our bearings right to come back. And someone knocked on the window, and she ran the window down, and they said yes. And she said, excuse me, are you 15-15 to faking them? So Margaret could have been a bus driver in Norfolk, but Mar Margaret, the failure of that meant her political career. And I'm also reminded of, fairly recently, uh, of Margaret coming to a party. Uh, in my raucous family uh, in Cardiff. Uh, and Margaret decided she'd take the role of being a photographer. So she took all the photographs. She's the only one ever that's managed to organise my family, which are like herding cats, to stand in a group and take these beautiful photographs. She's not in any of them, sadly, but actually she sorted it out. And later when we were going through them all, she said, well, I'd have made a very good photographer. She never doubted her abilities to do things. <laughs> so again, the photography's failure is the political success she had really so she bore her recent illness with great fortitude in the first conversation we had after her diagnosis she talked only about how it would impact on Siobhan and her concerns about Siobhan she was not concerned for herself she was not in any way feeling cheated where she had a good right to feel so and she was a gracious hostess until the end and we ate lots and lots of biscuits together so She's always been like the moral compass in my life. I feel her talking to me to tell me what the right thing is to do. Sadly, she always knew what the right thing was. I'm not sure I always did. So I'm going to spend a lot of time, as we have as friends in the past couple of weeks, uh, talking about what would Margaret do to try and think about that. I'm reminded of a post recently as well. Uh, on WhatsApp, where somebody said that a spiritual guider had told them the love that Margaret had for all of us, all here, near and far, the love that she had for all of us and she shared liberally with all of us, actually still here, and it's for us to make sure that we share that and nurture it and pay homage to it, really. So I think it's important that we take that forward, really. So and I'm reminded of Ibsen's quote, a community is like a ship. We all need to take turns to manage the tiller. And actually, Margaret, you managed that for years. You made sure that everybody was included in that. You made sure that you made adjustments for people. And you made sure that you actually acted for marginalised people and gave the vulnerable a voice. So my final uh, thought today is for you, Margaret. Um, if I never shared with you 
the honour and the privilege it's been. I hope that's because you knew. And I'll finish by saying something in God's own language. It's still about Margaret. Um, or von Hallen, uh, Gede Hariad. Thank you from my heart. Thank you, uh, Sa uh, Sarah, your kind words. May I now invite Honourable Tony Blair. When I spoke just over three weeks ago at the birthday party that tragically became awake, I spoke about the qualities which made Margaret our friend. Her integrity, her courage, her loyalty, the love she had for us and us for her. But today I want to speak about what Margaret taught us, what she taught us about the relationship between politics, principles, and power. Her politics were straightforward, direct, like Margaret. There was injustice, and it should be remedied. Poverty, and it should be confronted. Prejudice, and it should be banished. Her politics didn't require a lot of analysis, just a lot of work. She didn't waste energy on hating her opponents. She spent it on beating them. <laughs> she didn't hate Tories. She simply had different priorities. She didn't really hate the far left. Maybe she did a little, but... <laughs> but most of all, she hated their love affair with defeat. She didn't suffer fools gladly, but she did suffer them. <laughs> what she found insufferable were the faint-hearted. I remember one cabinet member who had fallen foul of Margaret's demand that he put his party, local party, in order, telling me, I've had enough of that bloody McDonough woman. <laughs> I'm going to go and sort her out. <laughs> oh, okay, I said. <laughs> I saw him a couple of days later. Did you sort Margaret out then, I asked. He looked sheepish. <laughs> She's very forthright, he said eventually. <laughs> that would be a no then, I said. Her pursuit of power was unfettered by anxiety over principle, not because she lacked it, but because she had it in such abundance that she never had to search her soul for it. She pursued power because without power, she knew all politics offers are promises, usually empty, wrapped invariably in self-indulgence. So, she set about helping us win power with the same mix of relentless zeal and steel she brought to any goal which excited her ambition. She assembled the means of winning, did the numbers, counted them in, counted them out, met the obstacles which barred her path, went round them, went under them and over them, and where necessary, went through them. Like any good general, she understood that success was a resolute combination of volition and will. And we marched happily behind her, knowing her capability would lead us to power and her principles 
would make the victory worth the march. Every achievement of that government, every family, patient, pupil, parent, low-paid worker who benefited from the difference a Labour government can make is an affirmation of this extraordinary woman and her determination. After Labour left power, she continued to adopt causes and people, giving them new vitality and hope. And with the same unrelenting, unadorned, unashamed will to win. I can see her now in my mind's eye. In my office, sat on the sofa, Wahid with her, always Wahid. Wahid, opining with exquisite reason why the task she had set me should be carried out no matter how unlikely. And Margaret alongside, sitting upright, like some chained tigress, <laughs> watching me with that piercing look and licking her chops menacingly if I gave any sign of being weak kneed or wavering. Magnificent, terrifying, and lovable. We will not forget her because we knew her. There are others, a future generation of political activists, who will never know her, but they will come to know of her, who she was, what she did, how she did it, and what she stood for. How idealism without realism is mere dreaming. How principles not put into practice don't change lives. And how in the end, compassion for the human condition is measured not by what you say, but by what you do to improve it. I'm not sure Resting in peace and Margaret ever belong in the same sentence. <laughs> but she can rest secure in this, that she will remain our example, our lesson, our inspiration, the leader of the band. For those of us into whose lives she ventured deeply, there will be another emotion along with the respect and the admiration. There will be love. Because, yes, she was special, and we loved her very much. Thank you, Honourable Tony Blair, your loving words. May I invite Sister Siobhan. This is precisely the point at which she would be shouting at me, why don't you write it down? <laughs> Thank you to everybody who's come today. Thank you to Gordon, to Tony, to Sadiq, to everybody here who's taken time out of their busy lives and busy days to be here. Whether you've come from America, from Ireland, from North London, or even from just around the corner. Thank you all so much to bear witness to Margaret's life. The reason why we are in this beautiful church of St Boniface is on the day of Margaret's diagnosis, the first thing she said to me was, Siobhan, my funeral has to be at St Boniface. St Joseph's is simply not big enough. So I'd like to thank Father Agnello, my parish priest, our parish priest at St. Joseph's, for understanding why we wanted to be here. 
I'd like to thank the amazing Father Sharju for allowing us to take over your church and for putting on such a wonderful mass. There are many similarities between Father Sharju and my sister, and as you can tell, organization is certainly one of those things. Every weekend, he has 1,500 people here worshiping. And as he would say, that doesn't happen by chance, it happens by organization. Did she ever tell you that herself? <laughs> and while we're here, is David Evans here? David, are you here? Can you see how nice these red and yellow flowers are? <laughs> Do you think we could ditch the red and white? <laughs> what do you think? So, how did Margaret become Margaret? I don't know. And I've thought about it every day for the last 19 months. What would I say about her? What could I say about her which would in any way do her justice? We've had the wonderful words from Tony. We had a great column from Danny Finkelstein in The Times, a conservative peer who described her as one of this country's greatest political organizers, certainly one of the greatest of the last 40 years. How did that happen? Well, you know, we were born to privilege. We were born in a family with a mum and dad who loved us and where we were the center of their lives. We probably didn't understand it, but everything they did, they did for us. Life could be hard and was often hard. My mum fought the refuge insurance company to give her a mortgage, something that didn't happen in the 1950s to working families. Our home was an oasis and a sanctuary for our family members who lost their way, who were ill in body or in spirit, who had problems with alcohol. They were always welcome in our house. And later, so many friends here today, from school, from university and afterwards, were welcome in Boundary Road when they too found difficulties. So I believe that she understood the meaning of community and the need to support from the life she led. And if anyone saw my dad, age 70, getting out to work at half five in the morning, blue with cold, they would understand her commitment and belief in work and an absolute idea that nobody but nobody earned you a living. Anybody who saw my mum wrap presents for the 30 patients on her long stay ward around the corner at St. Tooting Beck, at Tooting Beck Hospital would understand Margaret's kindness. And anybody who knew that my mum's motto was that you should always have two pounds in your pocket, one to spend and one to lend. And I'm sure, Keir, that might be a good motto for the next <laughs> Labour government. Her ambition as everybody knows, was to organise two general election victories which would lead to two full-term Labour governments. She didn't do that because she wanted status or notoriety, and she certainly didn't do it for the money. <laughs> she did it because she wanted to make our country a better place, and she wanted everybody to be guided and have the support to feel that hand at the small of their back, pushing them forward to be the very best they could be. And yes, to do that, she often had to be quite tough. She was a woman in a hurry. She could kill from a hundred paces with that stare. And it didn't matter 
whether you were the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary, the Foreign Secretary, or whether you were the canvasser that didn't get the mobile phone number. <laughs> that stare was the same. People often ask me, was I frightened of her? And the answer, of course, has to be yes. Yes, because I didn't want to let her down, because she was the very best sister that you could ever have, and she never let me down. People often scoffed at me. They would say, you only do what your sister tells you to do. Well, why wouldn't you take advice from the very best person? Margaret combined um, her fantastic professional life with being a great friend, a great cousin, a great comrade. She was there for everybody. There are people in this church today who would never have got their chance at university, who would never get the job they currently hold, who would never have achieved their ambitions without Margaret being behind them. On occasion, there are people in this church who wouldn't be alive but for Margaret's efforts. That's true, Anne, isn't it? On one particular occasion, Anne was unwell and Margaret got her to A&E by pretending to be me to the ambulance driver. <laughs> when Anne had got her treatment, she was very grateful to Margaret. And Margaret said, that's okay, Anne. Just from now on, always do what I say. No messing about. And Anne promised. I'm not sure she meant it. But at the time, I'm sure she did. Margaret's last campaign happened at the end of November 2021. She collapsed at a party in central London. It had been a normal Saturday, McDonough Saturday. We'd been to Jenny Bettridge's 40th birthday. We'd been to, uh, we'd been to um, John and Eva's uh, wedding celebrations. And we ended up a party in central London. She collapsed in front of me and had epileptic fits on the floor. Several hours later, they, two young doctors called Henry told me they thought she had a brain tumour. Four days later, when I got onto the ward, she said, get that, Dr Siobhan. It must be really bad news because he can't look at me. And it was bad news, the worst. She had a glioblastoma brain tumour. Her life expectancy on average would have been nine months. She would have had treatment that hadn't changed in 30 years. But she faced it with absolute courage and determination, never complaining. The journey from that day to her death on June 24th has been a struggle. But it has been with a great team the sort of team she always had at the Labour Party. And however hard this is, there are people that I must acknowledge. Waheed, for being the greatest friend that any woman could have. To Kevin Downey, our cousin who drove her from the day of her diagnosis to end up giving her care. I know, Kevin, that that can't have been an easy journey. To Mark, who was her brilliant carer, who is not with us today because he has gone to see his family in the Philippines, but his partner, Miles, will be here, and I hope, Miles, that you will pass on my great thanks. To Helen Williams for coming every weekend to care for her with me. We regarded ourselves as the carer B team uh, to Kevin and Mark. But nevertheless, she did it with great heart and great love. All the readers, 
all the pallbearers, all the people who came in the funeral cortege. I've asked for you to do what you've done, to say thank you for your support of Margaret. There will be many people I missed, and I regret that, but I know who you are, and your place is in my heart. During that journey, I am very sorry, I've forgotten Kathleen. Apologies, Kathleen. Kathleen came over from Ireland to be with us in her last week and came over during the course of her illness. And I'm ever so grateful, Kathleen. And to Moira, her friend from school days, who would turn on a sixpence to come back from Cornwall to be with us. Great people, great friends, added by so many people in this church today. There is one final person that I would like uh, to thank, and that is a new friend. He is now part of our family, whether he likes it or not, to Paul Mulholland, Margaret's oncologist. Due to Paul's intervention, she lasted for a further 13 months than the six he originally thought. I want to say to you, Paul, that there is another campaign and that will be to help you to ensure that future generations of people who suffer from a glioblastoma get better care and better treatment in the NHS. So, for so many of us, our hearts are broken, but she would not want us to waste our time being sad. She would want us to do something, to do something about the great injustices that so many people wrongly face. She would want to help Keir win the next general election. She would want people in the NHS not to wait 12 hours in our a &Es. So I would ask everybody here, whatever your politics, however you feel about something, do, in her words, what is not necessarily what you want to do, but to always do the right thing as she did. Thank you, uh, Siobhan, uh, not just for these uh, kind words and loving words, but also the hard work you put into the uh, last few weeks to give this fitting farewell uh, to your sister. As you uh, shared, she was your best sister. In the same way, for her, you are the best, still the sister. So. Uh, she has given so much for you and to the country uh, to treasure in our hearts. Uh, when you remember and treasure and nourish those memories, she never dies. She lives and reigns in your hearts and in the hearts of the people of this country. So be grateful to you and let us also thank God giving this opportunity for all of us come together to give our mind and heart and our prayers to Margaret. Sadly, brothers and sisters, we have come to the final prayer, final uh, farewell, the commendation service. Thank you for being with us at St. Teresa's. Thank you for the journey to be here with Margaret's family. Trusting in God, we have prayed together for Margaret and now we come to the last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see Margaret again and enjoy her friendship. Although this 
her family and this congregation will disperse in sorrow. The mercy of God will gather us together again in the joy of his kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another in the faith of Jesus Christ. of angels come to greet you may they speed you to paradise may the Lord enfold you in his mercy may you find eternal Into your hands, Father of mercies, Margaret's family, and all who are gathered here with us today and those who would wish to be here with us, commend our sister Margaret in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, she will rise with him. We give you thanks. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon Margaret in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. 
Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our sister Margaret forever. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You can walk my path You can wear my shoes Learn to talk like me And be an angel too But maybe You ain't never gonna feel this way You ain't never gonna know me But I know you Singing in my things can only get better, can only get better if we see it through. That means me, and I mean you too. So teach me not to think, can only get better, can only get, can only get, think it all a million. No, I know. No, they get
Sometimes I feel like throwing 